lot to get through tonight. Um, so we're just going to start with introductions and um, everyone, including um, non-committee members, um, everyone will say your name and um, where you live. And um, I'll start. I'm Allie Passion. I'm the chair of the CCAC and I live on Blue Ridge Avenue. Uh, Tom Loach, John McGett. Sean Baird, CCAC on Holly Street in St. Joe. Costa Sapporo, down 250. Sandy Houseman, Parkside Village. Countess Bacuza, Western Ridge. Doug Bates, Whitehall Road. David Mitchell, Barry Hill. I'm Jenny Moore, I represent you on the Planning Commission, and I live on Blue Ridge Avenue. Mike Kunkel, I live in uh, Court Park. Brian Day, Emerald Bridge. Um, who's next? You want to go around over here? Mm -hmm. uh, sure, Brian Victor, um, St. George Avenue. Martha Hodgkin, St. George Avenue. Tim Tolson, CCA Covenant. Uh, Mike Marshall, I live in uh, off the ridge. Jim Duncan, Pro Dye. Steven Schultz, yes to Brian and Martha. I'm from Blaster. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Schrader, Stonegate. Peggy Schrader, Stonegate. Paul Grady, Beaching River. Bill Spacuzzo, Western Marine. Uh, Doug Love, uh, Old Trail. Allison Rabel with the Daily Progress. Rebecca Kendall, Mount George Avenue. Kathy Craven, Railroad Avenue. Matthew Franz, St. George Avenue. Julia Franz, St. George Avenue. Lauren Diggins, Whitehall. Charlie Diggins, Whitehall Road. Marie Westbrook, Old Trail. Lynn Grant, Old Trail. Rosie Smith, St. George Avenue. Linda McNeil, St. George Avenue. Brad Daniels, Building the House in St. George Avenue. Steve Bates, Emerson Commons. Tim Murphy, St. George Avenue. Kayla Kendall, St. George Avenue. Orman Burton, St. George Avenue. Kelly Townsend, Old Trail. Matt Spalding, Laurel Hills. Uh, Danny Westline, St. George Avenue. Uh, Mary Huntington, I see John's. Stephen Johnson, also with John. Brian Cohen, the Berry Court, and your manager of John. I'm Michaela Cardi, neighborhood planner with Ethan Brown. I'm Jennifer Whitaker um, with Ravana Water and Sewer Authority. Uh, Dave Tungate with Ravana Water and Sewer Authority, and I live in West Hall. Bill Moyer with Ravana Water and Sewer Authority. And we've got the Crozet Gazette over there. <laughs> Um, all right. Um, so we're going to start oh, with the minutes. Um, I also wanted to say that Kelly has resigned. So. Oh. So do we find a replacement? Well, Andrew said we... that typically they have to have two openings to appoint new members, unfortunately. Or you wait until the next. So it's too bad she didn't quit in April, but that's what happened. <laughs> um, and so did everybody get a chance to look at the minutes? Mm -hmm. Move approval. Second. Second. All right. All in favor approving? Aye. OK. Let's um, start with John. Good evening, everyone. My name is Stephen Johnson. I'm the planning manager at Jaunt. I'm Brian Cohen. I'm the public relations manager at Jaunt. And I'm Mary Honeycutt. I'm the mobility manager with Jaunt. And we're very happy to see such enthusiastic turnout. <laughs> yes. We can't wait to tell you all about uh, the progress we've made. This is our third CCAC meeting that we've been to. So we're here to update you about the Crozet Connect schedule. So we had some draft information to present last month. Since then, we've done a little bit more tweaking. We also launched our Transit Pioneer program. So for a week, we had members of the Crozet community who expressed interest in testing out the service, riding along with our drivers on the buses, taking the bus to work, and giving us some really valuable feedback on how that service was working. So we've been able to incorporate some of that positive feedback, and we are ready to release the first version of our uh, schedule, and that's the big thing that we want to share with you tonight. Uh, so you'll be able to find this and get more details later by going to findyourconnection.org. 
Uh, this is an intermediate step towards building the web presence around some of our commuter services. So before our launch on August 5th, you'll see this change. We'll have a little bit more branding. But we put this information up now so that people would have access to it. So it talks about our different services as well as some of the issues around how would you get an emergency ride at home, what sort of uh, reduced commuter parking passes are available, etc. But you'll also be able to come up here to the Crozet Connect and access our Crozet Connect packet. It's got a little bit of that same information and introduces the routes that we're going to be launching on August 5th. So if you weren't here last month, we're going to be starting with two routes, one on the west side of Crozet and one on the east side. We thought that these were the parts of Crozet that would be the best starting place for transit service. They have pretty good sidewalk infrastructure, they have relatively high density, the road network allows us to do a lot of coverage without uh, double backing on ourselves, etc. Um, so that's where we're starting. And our schedule, uh, right now our, our funding allows us to operate two buses concurrently. So in order to maximize coverage both in space and time, we'll have 40 minute departures offset. So the west bus will start at 610, the east bus will depart next at 650, and then the west at 730, and then the final bus on the east side at 810. So you'll have some staggered options for getting over to Charlottesville. But this packet includes the schedules, the stop names, as well as some very detailed maps about proposed stop locations. Now, going forward, we're going to be working with Albemarle County to reach out to communities and make sure that uh, transit is welcome in these communities. We don't want to be putting uh, bus stops in the neighborhoods that are where it's wholly unwelcome. So, so we want to make sure that this is seen as a, a valuable option for the community. Um, to, to have some more connectivity, some more uh, ways to avoid having to park and having to drive the traffic. So similarly, we've got the east schedule down below with another map of all of the stops. Um, now Brian has a little bit of information to share about what's going to be happening between now and August 5th, but before we go over to that, um, does anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask about the service so far? You'd be putting up shelters for the uh, people waiting. That's a terrific question. So we are we love to do that as much as possible. We've already got enthusiastic support from the developers at Old Trail, so we'll be working together with them to put up a shelter. There are other places in Crozet where it won't be feasible that we we won't have the space um, in the public right of way, and we're not going to be digging up people's yards to put in bus shelters, obviously. Um, so there. Are, are other options. Um, in the long term, we're hoping to work more closely with developers in the urbanizing part of Crozet to make sure that we have not only great shelter, but also integration with uh, community and business services. Um, so the commercial opportunities at Old Trail. We'd like to promote the mutually beneficial relationships between riders and businesses that they'll have regular customers visiting every day. Riders will already be at the grocery store or the coffee shop so they can uh, wait comfortably or run an errand after work. Question? Question? Just in your very opening slide, it said $2 one way. In the table further down, it said $1.5 one way. I just wanted to point that out so you can clean it up. Sure. Right there. So. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, so you're right. I got these backwards. So yeah. the North 29 Connect is $1.50. Crozet is $2. Thank you for catching that. Yeah. Don't hold this to it, though. No, you said $1.50. Right. <laughs> Take a picture. <laughs> Thank you. For that. Any other questions? All right, Brian, take it away. Okay. Well, uh, we've got a few things to uh, kick off the Crozet Connect. Uh, first of all, June 29th, we're going to feature the actual bus in the parade and at the park. Where we'll be giving out uh, information and plenty of swag. Uh, on August 2nd, probably most unique, is we're uh, kicking off uh, the, uh, the service at Star Hill Brewery. <laughs> we'll have local band playing, but most importantly, we will be having a limited release of a beer label. 
featuring. Yeah, yeah, it's true. <laughs> I know I've, I've spoken to your heart. Uh, so get your growler. Uh, but it will be a limited release beer, and uh, we'll have that for a period of time. And uh, so that's going to be, that's of course at our Eastern Hub. Uh, on August, probably about August 3rd, the next night after that, we'll have a kickoff at Old Trail. So I'm speaking with the developer and someone who's acquainted with the HOA there uh, to get the merchants involved, and we'll have a party over there. Uh, one of the ideas is that we might even uh, do something with grit coffee, since commuters will need their cup of joe, uh, their dose of caffeine to get ready. Perhaps we can work something up with a special labeled uh, coffee. And so far, that's what we have. Any questions on the promotional events? Name of the beer? Uh, Don't know yet, and if I did, <laughs> I'd say that. <laughs> You'd have to show up and find out. Anybody else? All right. Thank you. If you do have any other questions, you can always reach us at crozeconnect at ridejaunt.org. Thank, Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, Amanda is getting set up. I forgot to say at the beginning, we do have a couple things not on the agenda, so we're going to try to save time for a couple people to talk at the end. So you ready for us? Yeah. Okay, thank you for having us again tonight. This is the third uh, summers in a row that we've been to talk about what's happening with the Ravana Water and Sewer Authority, particularly relative to the Crozet community. Again, I'm Bill Moyer, and I've got Jennifer Whitaker, our Director of Engineering and Maintenance, and Dave, your Dave Tungate from Crozet, who is our Director of Operations, and he runs all the water treatment plants and wastewater plants for us. So it's a pleasure to, to come back and talk to you guys about what we're doing in your area. Uh, we're going to do a little brief overview, kind of who Ravana is and what we do and, and the facilities we operate. Then we'll talk specifically about some of the projects related to Crozet. So the Ravana Water and Sewer Authority uh, was formed back in 1972 by the city and the county who decided they wanted one entity to run all the water and sewer systems for them, and that was Ravana. The county went further and formed the Albemarle County Service Authority who retails to you, their customers. So we, we make all the drinking water and we treat all the west wa wastewater, but we sell it to the Alcohol Service Authority and they retail it to you, their customers. And the same goes with the City Public Utilities Department. So we are the wholesaler, if you will, of water and wastewater for both entities. So we operate uh, four water systems in the county. Um, the largest we call the urban water system, which uh, covers this, all of the city, and I'll get my point here, all the city and the urbanized areas of Albemarle County, like 29 North, um, 250 West, and East. And we have three water treatment plants. The North Ravana Water Treatment Plant, which is off 29 North, South Ravana Water Treatment Plant, and the Observatory Water Treatment Plant, all make drinking water for the urban area, which uses between 9 and 12 million gallons a day. We also secondly have the Crozet system, due to your heart. You have your own Crozet water treatment plant, and we get your water from the Beaver Creek uh, Reservoir. And um, you use between 500,000 and 800,000 gallons a day, generally. and. Uh, and Dave's going to talk about some of the work that we have at the treatment plant. We also have a small system in Scottsville and even even smaller system at Red Hill now. So we, we operate four, all of the four water treatment systems in the county. Okay, we have five water supply reservoirs. So Sugar Hollow, South Fork Ravana, and Ragged Mountain all support what I was telling you, the urban area. Your Beaver Creek supports Crozet, and Scottsville has a reservoir that supports its water treatment plant. In total, we can store about 3.3 billion gallons of water in these reservoirs, and about, of which about 500 million 
are in <clears throat> the Beaver Creek Reservoir, 500 million gallons. So we also have six water truth plants. I mentioned the South Ravana water truth plant out near um, Sam's Club and Walmart. That's our largest plant, and that can make up to about 12 million gallons a day. <clears throat> the observatory treatment plant is up on Observatory Mountain uh, at the university. In fact, it's on property owned by the university, and uh, we, we have to lease that property from the university. North Ravana is out on 29 North. Your Crozet plant, uh, Scottsville has a plant, and this is a, what we call the water treatment plant at Red Hill. <laughs> little story behind that, it serves uh, 10, custom, 10 customers in Red Hill Elementary School. The, uh, there was a gas fuel leak some years ago that polluted the wells in that area, and so at the Virginia DEQ's request, a public water system was built, so we have a well there. Not a reservoir, but a well. We take it out of the ground, treat it, and pipe it to those customers. Small system. Okay. <clears throat> we also treat all the wastewater for the, for the county. And our, we have our largest plant we call the Morris Creek facility, which is, this is Interstate 64. Uh, Route 20 is right up here. So we're right at that intersection. Uh, I'd like to say it used to be the smelly place you would you would pass when you were on 64. We've done a lot of work to reduce odors at the wastewater plant, and we have significantly reduced that wastewater uh, odor. Now, all of the wastewater from Crozet makes its way to Morse Creek. So you are a part of the urban wastewater system. So all the city's wastewater, all the urban areas of the county, and Crozet come to this wastewater treatment plant. It treats about 11 million gallons a day. So, uh, so we pump it and pipe it from Crozet all the way to uh, Monticello Avenue, Morse Creek. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see what's next. So we do have a number of projects at, uh, for the Crozet community that total about $43 million in uh, things we've either recently completed, we're working on now, or we have planned for the future. So that's, uh, that's, that's my story here. Do you have any questions for me before I turn it over to Jennifer to talk about more details for these projects? Did this I understand thing. you correctly to say uh, South Fork can treat 12 million gallons a day? Yes, ma'am. Wow, okay. Yeah. That's cool. That's what its capacity is. More than is. I thought? Yeah. So we have three things. It's a three-legged stool in the water world. You have to have some you have to have supply, reservoirs, you have to have treatment, the plants, and you have to have piping. So we have to work in all three worlds. And really when we talk about getting 12 million gallons to customers' faucets, we have to make sure we have all three of those facilities in place. Okay, with that, Jennifer is our chief engineer. One more question. Okay. I just want to ask you a question. Do you have anything to do with or manage a, a pumping station or something on Route 250 uh, before you get to Florida on the left. Yeah. Probably, uh, that's one of the uh, well, super Because that's an odorous area. They can, at Farmington, yeah. We have worked on those okay. recently. We, so are you still having an odor oh. problem there? So that's one of the pump stations that brings the wastewater from Crozet okay. all the way back to Morse Creek. It doesn't keep going, apparently. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> well, we, we, have a, uh, we have a vendor, and their job is to measure the odor levels, and we, that's, uh, this hydrogen sulfide creates the odors. They measure those, and they put chemicals in to reduce the odors. So we're monitoring that. Well, they're there all the time. I mean, I drive in every day, and I'm, they're, they're, they're always working. Ma'am, is, is that near the Ivy Nursery and the Bobo dealer? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay. 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 Thank you. Yes, sir. What are the top, or what are the cost benchmarks that you use in the industry, and how do we compare to similar sized counties? For your retail cost? Retail cost. Well, that would be a question for the service authority, but I would think they would say that they're less expensive than the city. They they have been around, I think, the state average. Um, so but middle of the pack. Or is it like, I'm assuming it's dollars per gallon service, dollars per gallon. Dollars per, per thousand gallon, um, usually. Infrastructure cost per capita, something like that. So uh, what, what is it their infrastructure cost? 
I wouldn't have that number uh, hand, handy. We have about uh, 275 million million dollars in infrastructure assets that we manage. Now that's only within our plants and the piping we have. And the service authority has hundreds of miles and the city has hundreds of miles. And this, in a sense, we're all one system, but we have a part, we, we make the water, we treat the wastewater, we, we deliver it to them and they deliver it to you. Uh, but I don't have a metric of uh, okay, dollars so per, per maybe capita. Maybe let me ask a simpler question, right? Okay. <laughs> which, which is, how do you ensure that the service you're providing us is both high quality and cost effective? For A, we take a 150 samples a month in our water system, and we take hundreds of others in our plants to make sure that our drinking water meets all the state and federal standards. So we're constantly monitoring that. We report those to the state, and they look over our shoulder also. So as far as quality, we're subject to state and federal regulations, and we comply with those. Um, so that's the quality component. Our cost effectiveness, we're, we try to review our budget with our board of directors every year. Uh, and they, we have representatives from the service authority in the city, the county executive, the city manager are all on our board of directors. They review our budget with us. We explain to them what our costs are gonna be and, and that's how we um, approve it. Now, I would offer that sometimes it's hard to say, well, the cost of the city, and you compare it to the service authority, and you compare it to the city of Richmond, or you compare it to Lynchburg. Our systems have different ages, kind of like your house. If you've got a brand new house, your maintenance costs are a lot less than someone that's got a 75-year-old house. So it's the same dynamic that we have. We have, uh, I would say, a middle-aged system. Um, our plants are older. Uh, Dave's going to talk to you about, we're about ready to spend $35 million upgrading our, our two largest water treatment plants. But that's because they were built in the 50s and have had very little significant up, upkeep since then. So. so do we have a cohort of comparable county systems, something like that? Do we, we have peers around you know, I mean, we com that we communicate with. So how do we compare to them? Well, cost, again, that, that's mostly a, a, a retail question for the Alamo Service Authority. They have a chart, I know, in their um, brochure, in their budget, and they show exactly how the Service Authority costs compare to other um, retails because they have their own expenses. So they take our costs, we're about 65% of their budget. But the other 35% is for them to distribute the water to you, read the meters every month, replace meters, I repair broken lines. I think they're trying to add an automated meter reading system to be more efficient and effective. So for the retail, I would have to defer to them, but I know they have information to, to answer that. I would suggest that we get Gary O'Connell to come back sometime sure. when we can in the fall. Yeah, from the and on the serviceauthority.org website has all the costs for this for locally, but I'm sure he can be happy to yeah, provide we all can the get I want to make sure we have time locally. to yeah. hear about the projects that they do. Okay. That's just a, great just a quick question, does the upgrade include any methods for dealing with pharmaceuticals in the water? Are we there yet? Mm -hmm. Look up, the we, we can talk, we'll touch on that when we get to Dave's the Dave's our yeah, expert on that, he'll talk yeah. about yeah. that. Yeah. No <laughs> question, too. Glad to hear it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, I'm here to talk a little bit about sort of the, the bigger infrastructure that sort of sits outside of the, the fence of the water treatment plant. So the first item on this list, and Dave, if you don't mind going, is the drinking water infrastructure plan. The last two summers we've been here talking about the drinking water infrastructure plan. This plan was conceived as we started noticing that our water production numbers were rapidly rising along with the population that was being served here in Crozet. And so what we wanted to do is ensure that we were able to project what was coming our way and get, start getting capital infrastructure projects in the pipeline, in the funding pipeline, in the design pipeline, in the permitting pipeline, because quite often our projects take sometimes years, if not decades, to get permitted. And so we wanted to make sure that we were able to react quickly enough uh, to the things that were coming. So we wanted, part of the study identifies projected water demands all the way through 2075. Um, we've talked about 
what these facilities currently can do, what they need to be able to do in the future, and any modifications that we need to make. And in some cases, we're making full-blown modifications all at once, and in some cases, it's very stepwise. So we might do a project uh, in the next 10 years, and then 30 years from now, do a, a second project. We also wanted to have a roadmap so that those who came after us, or even ourselves 10 years from now, when we, we sort of scratch our heads, what did, what did we intend? Um, we can open it up and, and really understand what the intention, what the assumptions were behind uh, the, the projects that were planned, so that if the assumptions change or the conditions change, we, we know how to react and, and improve. So a couple things that we found in that plan was Beaver Creek Reservoir is an adequate water supply for this community at build out, which like I said is 2075. Um, that is just about the maximum use of Beaver Creek Reservoir, so when we get beyond that point, we will either have to talk about different water supplies um, or, or other alternatives. But through the planning horizon, Beaver Creek is adequate for uh, this community. We will have to go under a water withdrawal permit with the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality, and what that will mean is that we will have mandatory releases from the reservoir into Beaver Creek and into the therefore into the Meachams. Uh, currently, we do release water past the reservoir, but it's a functional release based on the infrastructure that's there. It is not a permitted release, it's not a required release. So we will have a much more structured release that will um, continue over the entire duration of the permit. We'll also be increasing the water treatment plant, um, doubling it in size. That serves two purposes, one will be able to treat Average day demand, which is your, you know, most of your year, but it will also allow us to better handle our peak days. This community has a fairly high peak day ratio, and so we want to make sure that on those hot summer days, we're able to provide water as well. We don't want to just be able to provide water in April and September. We really would want to make sure that throughout the summer, throughout any conditions that we might see, we have adequate supply, adequate treatment capacity, and adequate pumping. Uh, again, we're looking at a long-term second phase treatment uh, plant upgrade by 2042, and then also a couple water distribution piping projects, excuse me. One will be uh, along 250 in, by 2030, and then others will be by the service authority out in the outer edges of the distribution system. So uh, we're also talking about some of the projects that, uh, yes sir? Before you leave that first slide, would you go back? Sure. I'm trying to balance what you're calling the Crozet area and the needed demands by 2075. So what is your definition of the Crozet area? So we spent a tremendous amount of time defining that exact thing. So we went through with county planning staff uh, and looked at the Crozet master plan. We looked at all of the current jurisdictional boundaries. We talked with county staff about um, there are several sites sort of adjacent to the area. We talked about, we looked at areas that were in the jurisdictional boundary, which is an area that can currently be served by water and sewer, that may be, um, there, there's a couple areas that are cut out. So if those areas were to fill in, and then that is the, and then we projected that out based on historical demand, based on high use, low use, uh, employment use, and we came up with an envelope and then develop the most likely scenario. So it does not dramatically increase the size of the jurisdictional boundary. Uh, and we do have a map in our study that shows that jurisdictional boundary. That is set by the Board of Supervisors. And Albemarle County Service Authority cannot offer connections to anyone outside of that jurisdictional boundary without a zoning amendment. So it is the current, zo the current zoning boundary with just a few strategic properties included in it um, just because of historical artifacts that may make them be able to be served by water in the future. Does that, does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, great. Crozet finished water pump station. It's the, it's the little red building as you go by the water plant as opposed to the big red building. Um, so our old plant uh, and old pump station was built in the early to mid 60s. It was in a hole, frequently flooded, uh, it got too hot, we had to open the doors, it frequently had other issues associated with it. There was a real reliability issue and for about the last two years we've been working very diligently to get this designed and installed and now 
This pumping station is state of the art. Um, we, we intentionally did not necessarily um, spend a tremendous amount of uh, money on our exterior architecture, uh, but we did put, <laughs> admittedly, um, but, uh, but we did, this, this pump station is fully redundant. It can supply not only our current max day, it, can, um, it has the capability to expand in the future. We've got fully redundant power. Uh, and all of the historical electrical HVAC problems are all addressed. So this pump station will serve this community well into the future. In fact, we're projecting to be able to use it through the entire planning horizon in 2075. So dramatic improvement in having this pump station online, extremely reliable compared to where we were even a year ago. This is a wastewater equalization facility. This picture is one in Henrico uh, that will is being proposed. It will go along 250. We have an existing pump station near the Licking Hole Dam. Um, you, it's near the one of the entrances to Fairhill Estates, sort of the closer to town entrance, I do believe. The closer to Charlottesville. Sorry, can you clarify? Um, so the currently this is this the pump station. Number, we call it Crozet Pump Station 4 because flow comes from Crozet through 4, through 3, through 2, through 1, and into the urban system. So this is the place where all of the Crozet wastewater finally gathers and makes its long trip into town. And so at this location, there's currently a pump station there. Um, and what we are proposing is a facility, basically a storage tank. And that storage tank is an enclosed storage tank with odor control facilities, and when we have high peak flow wet weather events, those flows will be stored, and then as the rain calms down, those flows then get pumped into the urban system. What this does is allows us to continue to serve the community without having to upgrade all four pump stations and the 10 or 12 miles of piping that go into town. So this is being sized with the potential 30, 40 years from now of a, additional tank on site. We don't anticipate that within our 2060 planning horizon at this point, but we did, since we were acquiring land and configuring all the piping and pumping stations, we did decide to go ahead and make sure we had adequate space for it in the future if we needed it. Uh, Licking Hole Stormwater Basin. So if you go around Crozet Pump Station 4 and follow the trail, um, you'll come to Licking Hole uh, Dam, which is a small uh, concrete dam that basically serves as a stormwater retention facility. And this was came to be part of Ravana's inventory, uh, in part because the county felt that this was a great stormwater protection for the South Fork Reservoir to handle some of the stormwater runoff and erosion from construction within the Crozet community, and because we own dams, it seemed like a great idea for us to, and we operate the South Fork Reservoir, it seemed like a great opportunity for us to, uh, to take ownership. So we own a stormwater detention pond with a 16 foot high dam in, in your community. So one of the things we're doing, this facility is intended to be dredged over time. And so one of the things we're doing this summer is actually doing a full bathymetry, which is an underwater survey so that we can get compare that bathymetry to the construction topography and figure out what how much sedimentation is in the lake, um, how soon we might have to dredge, how we would potentially deal with that, and, um, and be able to make plans going forward. So the last... Yes, sorry. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm the first property downstream from that. <laughs> yes, sir. I have had an enormous amount of erosion over the last 15 years that I've lived there. It's gotten so much worse in the last five years. <coughs> the, the, the creek has moved, I'd say, at least 50 feet onto my property in the last 15 years. And it, it, it's, 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 you know, the stormwater is only going to increase because there's going to be more impervious surface in Rosé. So it's only going to get worse. So are you responsible for the erosion downstream? 
No, sir. <laughs> the simple answer is no, sir. So what we do is we operate this dam and we operate the basin from an erosion, from a, a sediment standpoint. The, all of the zoning and enforcement, both upstream and downstream from an erosion standpoint, is within the jurisdiction of Albemarle County. So I, I'm not try, I earnestly am not trying to, uh, to pass the buck, but really the erosion issues uh, and sediment control issues are within Albemarle County's jurisdiction. So if that, if that helps. Yes, ma'am. Even with all the heavy rains, have you found that the constructed wetland along Jose Avenue is impacting the amount of silt, or maybe you won't know until you do the that much. That, that's really, um, it's hopeful that that's, th that's, that's what we're, we'll, we'll know is once we look at that bathymetry. And then, I, to be honest with you, I think we probably will be doing more frequent bathymetry so that we have a better feel for um, impacts over time to give us a, a, a decay rate, if you will, so that we can make sure we, we adequately maintain the facility. I'm, I can, if you'd like afterwards or some other time, I can I can give you the right people to talk to at the county. There, there are I've some. I've talked to a lot of them. Okay. We'll get, Frank, we'll get Frank Paul up there. <laughs> sure. Um, so here is the Beaver Creek Dam and Pump Station. So this one's going to be a very visible project over the next few years. We've talked a little bit. I think we presented some information last time. Beaver Creek Dam um, was constructed as a joint project between the county and eventually, uh, and NRCS, and eventually turned over to Rivanna Water and Sewer Authority to operate. It's an earth dam, and it currently passes what we call one half of the PMF, which is the probable maximum flood or the probable maximum precipitation. Virginia in 2016 through 2018 passed new legislation requiring any dam that they call high hazard, and high hazard doesn't mean the dam has a problem. High hazard means there are people that live downstream. Um, sometimes it's a road, sometimes it's houses, sometimes it's farms, but if it's high hazard, which this dam has been reclassified to a high hazard dam, because there are people that live downstream, then you have to be able to pass 100% of that probable maximum precipitation, which for this area is calculated at 31 inches in 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So this, this dam is not able to pass that flow rate at this current time. Mm -hmm. And so what we will be doing is upgrading the spillway, of this facility. Now, like most things in Albemarle County, they kind of live in the bottom of a valley. Um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of valleys, and most of our infrastructure, at least, is at the bottom of them. And so there isn't really room to expand that area for the water to pass by. And so what we've um, come up with as a design is a labyrinth spillway, which is basically a zigzag spillway. So if you were to take a piece of paper and say, the way that we pass water through and over a dam is that it has to go over that entire length. And the longer the length, the more water you can pass. Well, if we can bend that, sp that piece of paper, you still have that same length, but you have it in a much more compact footprint. And so what we're proposing is called a labyrinth spillway, which is a zigzag. It'll have three and a half turns or cycles in it, and that will be in the middle of the dam. Well, for any of you who've spent some time at that dam, there's a pump station down at the tow. That pump station can't stay there. And so also with this project is a proposed plan, excuse me, proposed plan to move that pump station onto the shore, which is more current practices, and separate the dam and the pump station from each other. So this project is designed current, anticipated currently to be built between 2023 and 2026. Um, there's some pretty significant effort that will go in here. Uh, we've already started some of the permitting work, some of the, the neighborhood coordination work. Um, it is likely, and I, I, I say this and I point this out, that Browns Gap Turnpike may be closed during a portion of this construction. Um, so there, we're, we're working on design to try to minimize that, but because the zigzag goes across the dam and across the road, we will need to build a bridge. And so during the time period where we can build the spillway and the bridge, the road will have to be, at this point, looks like it will have to be closed. And then once we can get the bridge in place, we can do the rest of the construction while the road is open. So we're, we're working through that, those, those details now. Yes, sir. Yesterday, I went to the 240-250 roundabout that, um, that VDOT is working on. 
Yes, sir. And they're talking about 680 or the Browns would have roads being closed for uh, about two months. Is there any chance you can coordinate those two, or are the <laughs> projects <laughs> not possible? So, so there, there's the time frame to build a dam is astronomical. I think is is a is a, a proper assessment. Um, there, there's a tremendous amount of permitting, and it's it's for good cause. But there's a tremendous amount of permitting, design, and construction activity that goes into it. And also, unfortunately, there's also a tremendous amount of expense that goes with this. And so, as part of our capital planning process uh, this year, we did make a decision to move this project back a couple years in order to. Um, work through our rate structure with Albemarle County Service Authority. And so the some of that may make the timing of these two projects such that they are not coincident. One thing we are working on is the federal government through NRCS does have some grant funding for historic NRCS dam upgrades. And we are working through our lo local government, the state government, and the federal government to potentially get some grant funding. If we're able to get some grant funding, we may be able to move the project up to a more recent time. Whether or not that timing um, works is, we, we are talking with VDOT about their timing and our timing because because of the, the road specifically. So we, we are aware of what their timing is and, and we're all talking to see if there's there's possibilities to make some overlap there. Cool. We'll let Dave talk about the other Great. Sandy, I'm glad you asked that question about pharmaceutical byproducts. It's a, it's a subject that we don't talk about a lot. We have no wastewater discharges upstream of any of our drinking water reservoirs. We have no wastewater <laughs> discharges upstream of any of our five drinking water reservoirs. There aren't many communities in this part of Virginia that can say that. Now, the source of personal care products, pharmaceutical byproducts, from the, from the mo most part, is from wastewater treatment plants. Uh, Richmond can't say that. Lynchburg can't say that. Virginia Beach can't say that, we can say that. So July of 2012, this community came together and decided we don't want to use chloramines for stage two drinking water compliance. We wanted to go with granular activated carbon. Everyone knew that cost a little bit more money for, for all our consumers. And that was a decision that was made by all four boards. And it was a pretty momentous occasion. So we had a project, April 2015 to uh, April 2018, where we added at the Crozet plant, to the existing conventional surface water treatment plant, we added two 20,000 pound GAC contactors. And granular activated carbon, those of you that, that have aquariums, those of you that have Brita filters, it looks just like black uh, grape nuts. And um, <laughs> it's, it's activated carbon, so it's coal that's been superheated and fractured and has absorption, uh, absorptive capacity uh, in, in the, the carbon itself. Uh, this building, that's the red building, that's just west of the conventional treatment plant. Um, we completed it in April 2018 and uh, $3.8 million. Uh, what it was put in for was disinfection byproduct control. Uh, there's two major disinfection byproducts that, are looked for, that we look for in the water that's required by the state, required by the EPA, and that's halocetic acids on the left and trihalomethanes on the right. The black vertical line shows when the carbon went in, went in service. And you can see that the haloacetic acids and the trihalomethanes have decreased since we put the carbon in, in, in service, right? So those of you that are ratepayers, that's a good thing, right? You paid for something and it worked. That's a great story. We like to tell that. Um, any questions on this? What are the sources of those two pollutants? It's total organic carbon. So there's a myriad of, of items that are considered total organic carbon. And so we look at how we're treating the water in the conventional water treatment plant, and then we uh, we dose the water through the activated carbon contactors to achieve a total organic carbon level of less than 0.75 milligrams per liter. And then these are taken, these samples are collected in the distribution system. There are two representative sites in Crozet, one is in, one's in Fox Chase and one's at Brownsville Market. Uh, across from Brownsville Market, those are sites that were determined uh, through a study that was done uh, 10 years ago where the EPA had to then approve those sites as representative distribution sites for Crozet. They mentioned the chlorine and the organics and how they... So we add chlorine to the water. We use a sodium hypochlorite. It's a bleach solution. The bleach you guys buy in, in, uh, for clothes, or anyone buys, it's a 6%. We have a 12% solution, and then we dose the water. So the organics, if they're against or higher, we add chlorine to the water to disinfect it. 
the trihalomethanes and haloacetic acids will be higher. But since we've reduced those organics in the water, we don't tend to have, we don't have uh, as much uh, disinfectant byproducts in the water. Yes. Wasn't the problem at the end of the line also for the sort of last customers? So before the again, Bill talks about multiple legs. We have a treatment leg, we have disinfection, and then we have a distribution system. And unfortunately for us, we sell the water. We have a small distribution system here in Crozet, but the county manages the rest of the distribution system. So in coordinating with them and their activities, that's why sometimes you'll see flushers in the system. Water's like milk. You can't keep it in the refrigerator for a month, expect to grab it, and it'll be good. So water has an age to it. You can't leave it in the system. You can't leave it in the tank for days at a time, weeks at a time. So there are flushers that the county has in the system here to turn things over to keep it fresh. And what's the red in our water? You know, so, much so red rings yeah, if you look at ACSA's website, they have a real good tutorial on what that is. It's actually, it's a, I believe it's mold that comes from uh, mulch in oh. particular. Yeah. Water bacteria, so that's how people call it. Yeah, I, it's, it's, it's related to the mulch. Yeah. And what was that website? ACSA, I don't know their website. Yeah. I'm Mark Hannes. Okay. Do you mind standing in the middle? So oh, I'm this. sorry, I was, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm walking around, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. So this is our historic before and after. Yes. Um, can you define, like, is this good or bad, and how are you defining good? So the red line on the top, that is, so, yeah, Bill, sorry, uh, if I can figure it out. Okay, so that is the maximum contaminant level. So my uh, halo acetic acids can't be over 60. And so you can, as you can see, we had levels this last time between 20 and 30. If we were less, we're less than 60, so we're three times less than 60. And our trihalomethane, the level we can't go over is 80. And again, this last quarter, we were again between 20 and 30. Right, so that's the statutory maximum. Uh -huh. But if we were to look at this and say, how do we compare to anyone else? What should our targets be as opposed to what's our, you know, we're going to get sick level? How do we compare? I don't, I don't know how well, we're doing well. I, I don't know how there we can There are not do. many systems around that have granular activated carbon. Mm -hmm. So they either have to find a different way to remove the disinfection byproducts, or they try to keep them below 60 and 80. And they're OK regulatorily. But we would say that's why our water is of higher quality, because we're not only just below the minimum, we're way below, or the, the maximum allowed, we're way below. So are most water systems just below the minimum, or are most it, water it, systems way below? It's hard to say. We, we don't get too involved in what other systems do. Some places chloraminate, which again was a discussion that happened in 2012. Mm -hmm. The Tidewater region, DC chloraminates, and they keep their, they, they change the chemical reactions in their water to keep their levels lower. So I guess my question comes back to, if we don't keep track of what other systems are doing, how do we know if we're doing it well or not doing it well? So well, we look at this graph, and we can see that we're doing it well because we are way below the what the rest of limit. the country right. has to comply with. No, no, we just talked about so the compliance. That's our minimum standard. Mm -hmm. But as far as performance goes, we don't know if we're performing better or worse than other systems. Well, but we do know what is good performance and what is bad performance. Right. How? No, well, we because of the science of how much of the contaminants are in the water. I mean, but I guess the goal should be zero, so, right? No, no, no. So there, there's, there's sort of another layer to this, and that is what is your source water, and what can you do with your source water to achieve the goal? Mm -hmm. So you go to tide water, the natural organics in the surface water and tide water are off the charts. Mm -hmm. So what they have to do to barely be compliant mm -hmm. is a tremendous difference than what we do, than what you do further west, than what you do. And, and so, so this is very good production levels, very good chemistry for the state of Virginia. This is, when we go to conferences and we talk to people, this, they, they are like, wow, your community chose to spend this kind of money to get those kind of results. It, it, is, it is absolutely a, a very high quality, high so standard within Virginia. Are we in the 90th percentile of Good water? Are we in the 95th percentile? Depends on what your variables are. Let's ask Gary. Let's ask Gary. Let's ask Gary. Because they don't sell us the water. Oh. Okay. I would just like to add it. It looks like we were doing pretty well based on what you're saying before we added those. Yeah. Yeah. And what the grain activated carbon does is it ensures that we will always meet those levels because of. This goes back to February 17. If you took it back further, the levels have changed. EPA used to be 180. Now it's 
60 and 80 for the MCLs. And so that has changed. Another thing, you've been reading the paper about PFAS, P-F-A-S, yes. PER and polyfluorinated alkaline substances, which is a man-made man chemical on clothing, carpet, pizza boxes, McDonald wrappers, and it is in a lot of water systems. And GAC filter is the top ranked filter to remove PFAS. So we're, we're, uh, we would say we're getting benefits that we're not even fully aware that we're getting with this GAC system. Yeah. And regulation of that is coming. And it's, it's being discussed in, in Congress now about regulating that. Right now it is not regulated. We tested our, I'm sorry, one other thing. We tested our water system. We couldn't find any PFAS. Again, because Dave said we don't have industries upstream of where we get our water. So that's a good thing. I'm sorry. Awesome. Hi. Um, so I guess I, I'm assuming that maybe like the statutory level is maybe what you're uncomfortable with, right? Like, do we trust the EPA? Do we trust the statutory no, level, no, no. right? But, oh, so I have a practical right. question, yeah. which is really like, okay, I'm not a chemist. I'm a mom. We got kids. Sometimes they get a little bottle. And I use water. Should I be filtering that through a Brita filter? Like, if we have this water, should I then take any other further methods? Or do you, like, do you guys serve, do you just drink out of the tap? Do you yeah. <laughs> I want to know tap. practically, like, what do I do? Well, practically, we would say we have a very high quality water, and <laughs> these graphs justify that. It we looks are way like that. below the So do you all filter standard. your water? And yes. Just, okay, great. I mean, it, wait, so wait, you filter it again? Mm -hmm. the at home? No. Oh, no. 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 I mean, okay. a lot of some people do. You know, you have a filter in your refrigerator, yeah, okay, that's in there. Right. But we wouldn't say anyone needs to have their own filter if they're on public water. We take care of the filtering for you. Cool. Practical application. Thank you. Okay. So, quick question. Do you do pre-treatment sampling? Yes. Do you have those numbers? I mean, do you see where those so these contaminants are rising? Which, which contaminants? The, the total organic carbon. So these are the function of the finished chlorine. So the, the disinfection step, the last thing we do to the water is we disinfect it. And this is a function of that disinfection. So we, you wouldn't see this coming in the plant because we don't disinfect the water until it leaves the plant. Correct. But, but your efficiency and the functionality of your filtering yes. could, could yes. be we, greater than what we realize because we don't know what that pre number is. So contaminants could be increasing, the filtering could be working. So mm -hmm. we see a small drop, but it could be a dramatic drop because we could be mm -hmm. in a different place. Yeah, for total organic carbon, we see right. higher numbers coming into the plant. Yeah. And so, sometimes it's the... storm related and yep. seasonal as well. Mm -hmm. okay. 10 to 15 coming out, then 0.75. I'm coming in and 0.75 going out. Because right. this, 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 this just represents a time graph. It doesn't yes, necessarily right. represent improvement of current. This is showing the distribution sites represented for Prose. So this is just an impact of the treatment, but I don't, I didn't drill down about bringing that treatment stuff here. Yeah. I'm not sure to whom this should be addressed, but what are the cons security concerns about the sources of water, such as the dam and so forth? Are there any, is there any functional group that looks at security of these resources? Well, the EPA is requiring water utilities. There was a law passed called the American Water Infrastructure Act of 2018 uh, in Congress, and it requires all the utilities uh, of a certain size, including us, to review the vulnerabilities of our water and wastewater facilities for terrorism, natural hazards. We had to do it back in 2002 after the terrorism attack around the country. There was a Bioterrorism Act passed that made all the utilities do a vulnerability assessment. And essentially, we're updating it now, but expanding it to hurricanes, tornadoes, natural disasters, and not just bioterrorism, to make sure that everyone has a plan for uh, redundancy. If a water treatment plant gets impacted and wiped out by a hurricane, what are you going to do? Or if a, water, or a reservoir was impacted, a dam was washed out. What are you going to do? So we, we have to submit a certification of that by March of uh, next year. So yes, the EPA monitors that, and they require a plan from all of us, which is not foia That would be protected and need to know.
So, the water treatment plant, it's under, Jennifer touched on it, we're going to spend $8.5 million, we're going to upgrade the water treatment plant in Crozet. Uh, this is 240, this is the GAC facility to the west. This conventional surface water treatment plant was built in the late 60s, and, and let's understand we are going to upgrade the capacity of the treatment plant. There's nothing wrong with the treatment plant now. The technology works for meeting a high quality standard of water. We are increasing the capacity for the growing needs of this community. Uh, so it's going to start uh, start in December of 18, uh, so a couple months ago, and we expect to be done in December of 22. So if you go out there now, you'll see you'll see a lot of construction, you'll see a lot of trucks. Um, is the building getting bigger? The building is going to stay the same. Yeah. We're going to add uh, some more chemical storage in the back, and many much of the work will be done in these basins here, and it won't actually affect the footprint. Yeah. Um, we have a buck sample tank chlorination system. So again, we talk about treating the water at the source, talk about treating it at the filtration plants, and we send it out into the system. Our buck sample tank, which actually sits on Beaver Mountain Road, um, this is the far end of our system. It's a two million gallon water storage tank. And to ensure high chlorine residuals in the far reaches of our system, we are designing a chlorination system uh, for this buck sample tank to add additional chlorine if we need it. Um, is there any questions? <laughs> Thank you. So the extra chlorination at Bucks Elbow would be added on a daily basis if your testing in the morning said to do it. So we have some online instrumentation there that, okay. that sends us a trigger. And there's a couple different ways we can do it. One is mo moving the tank level up and down. Uh, some is some, some distribution system flushing with the automatic flushers that ACSA has. And then the final step is uh, adding chlorine to the tank. And the last picture reminded me, when I drove by the other day, I noticed that the little basin across the street, which looks like it has a canvas yeah, we should, on it, I mean, it has standing water sitting on top. So how do you get rid of that so we don't grow mosquitoes? You mean on, on the other side yeah. of, from the water treatment plant? Yeah. So we should talk about that. We are adding in this project, there are two basins there now, the east and the west. The western basin is going to go away and there will be a concrete tank there in its place. Okay. And we will then, we're going to take the liner out of the east basin, put a new liner in. That's where we handle our processed water for our water treatment plant, and our blow down from our said basins, and our backwash water. So we're going to improve that as part of this project. That's probably one of the most noticeable things out of this project would be. But the water doesn't sit there for more than a day or so, right? Without no. Changed. No, we have a discharge okay. that goes okay. back to the Thank you. Yes, sir. What is the source of your capital? Source of our capital? We actually sell water to our Mount County Service Authority out here in Crozet, and they pay us on a gallon. So it's cash yeah, it's based on our, our so you don't know that. We have a lot of debt, two hundred million dollars to be exact. That's why our rates, uh, fifty percent of our cost is debt. Why? Because we finance the major projects, not the county, not the city. Ravana finances all the major infrastructure, utility projects, and we carry the debt. And that's by design. That's on, on purpose. So we have the debt. And, and as Dave said, all of our revenue comes from selling water to the service authority and selling it to the city. The biggest production time of the day, guess what it is? Allie knows. Between six and, nine, between six and eight in the morning. Why? Because everyone gets up, takes a shower, yeah. makes coffee, and heads out the door. I run the tap for two hours, too, just for fun. Yeah, we appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. In response to that, I'm referring to the rates about the tears from the morning. Yeah. It's just so refreshing, you can't stop me. <laughs> hey, Ryan, go ahead. Yeah, I, um, I know this is a question probably for ACSA, but um, Crozet is an old community. We have a lot of old pipes that come off of the distribution systems into our homes. A lot of those pipes are probably still bad pipes. Um, is he? No? I don't think so. Uh, I've heard the service authority say they are not aware of any lead pipes in their system. That's what I've heard them say. Now they own up to the meter, and you own from the meter into your house. So what your plumber did when he built the house, the service authority may not be knowledgeable of that. You can look under your house and see, but um, but they, I'm pretty sure, would say they don't have any lead pipes in their system that they're aware of. Not in their distribution system, but from their distribution system into our taps inside our house. I mean, most houses are 100 plus years old. Well, yeah, again, they, they don't own from the meter into the house. Yeah. Yeah. I know they don't. That's why I'm asking the question. Yes. So the question is, does ACSA or anybody do any lead testing 
inside the household? We, we do, uh, we have to submit to the state who regulates for the EPA our water quality standards from our water treatment plants. And we have to submit, we have to maintain a, a certain pH leaving the water treatment plants at all times. We have to, we have to measure the corrosivity of the water. Right. So there are checks and balances. Right. And then there is a uh, lead and copper program that ACSA manages out here in, a, in, in, in the Crozet area. And I don't want to talk too much about Flint, but I want everyone to understand we have consistently fed a corrosion inhibitor product in Ravana's water system for 30 plus years. That was something that Flint neglected to do when they transitioned from Detroit water to Flint water. That's something that not all communities have done. There's a cost associated with that, but it's a consistency and effectiveness, and we've always done that. So that provides another further layer of protection to this community. So if you, if you have that 100-year-old 100 house and it does have lead uh, pipe, we have a chemical in the water that, that keeps it from leaching the lead into yeah. the drinking water. So you're minimizing the risk. Yes, yes sir. It's yeah. yeah. a uh, ortho... A polyphosphate, polyphosphate product that we put in. Okay. Good Great, question. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all. I'm Frank Stoner, I'm with Milestone Partners. I haven't been here in a while, but I apologize. Um, I see a number of faces I know, but I see some that I don't know. So um, I'm here tonight to give you an update on the Barnes Lumber Project um, and to show you some of the stuff that's kind of going on behind the scenes, because I think it's been a couple of years since I was here. And believe it or not, things have actually been happening. Um, so I'm going to have to kind of go back and forth because I don't have uh, an assistant with me. But um, this just kind of brief summary of where we've been. Um, we
we started this process back in 2014. Um, and uh, I won't go through all these in detail, but suffice to say, we've been at it for a while. Um, and when we got to about 2017, we kind of came up with a plan that seemed to resonate within the community. And uh, this was a long, arduous process that started with a rezoning application for the whole site. There were issues, sort of a tension between the comprehensive plan as it's currently written and what we were proposing to do, which included a fair amount of residential. And so we kind of backed up and said, gee, what could we, what could we do that everybody would agree with? Um, and it would allow us to get the project started. And so we identified this six acre, six and a quarter acre piece. Um, and there was a group of folks who got together, Crozet residents um, that you all know, some of whom served on this board and some of whom are on this board now. Um, and they were s sort of the voice of the community as, as this process went forward and we ended up hiring a, a design firm out of Baltimore who came down and, and this is what they created. This is the master plan they created. This uh, plaza design, which is conceptual at this point, um, was sort of a collaboration between Warren Bird, who lives here, and MRA, who did the uh, original master plan. So, What's happening now, or what <coughs> happened since uh, I was last here, is we've been trying to figure out how do, how do we make this actually happen. The economics of a six and a quarter acre piece are very challenging, and it's because it's largely commercial. Um, that, that makes it challenging as well. And so we started conversations with the county um, to try to figure out how we could get some of the key infrastructure pieces in place. Uh, after a year of meetings, um, we have finally, uh, I think, um, come to a, an agreement over how this could happen. That agreement will go, or a draft of that agreement will go to the board next week um, for their consideration. So you're going to kind of get uh, some of the pieces, parts of it tonight. I don't have much time, so I'm going to try to go as quickly as I can. Um, but. This has sort of been an exhaustive process over the last year, year and a half with the county. Uh, I will say the county gets plenty of criticism from lots of places. They have been a delight to work with. Um, the whole team there has really been incredibly supportive. And so um, hopefully uh, next Wednesday, um, the board will review it and, and they'll uh, endorse it and we'll move forward. Um, the county refers to this as Project Patriot. Um, it's, I don't know why they named it that, but um, <laughs> it's brought with it some of its own challenges. Um, but these are the reasons really why the county ended up supporting the project. Uh, it's completely consistent with the comprehensive plan, it's consistent with the Crozet Master Plan. Um, it allows us to develop downtown, which has been a challenge from, for many, many years, as, as you all know. Um, and so, and it was, and it was kind of a, an equitable sharing of risk uh, for us to get there. Um, this is what phase one looks like, and this is the subject of the public-private partnership. There are two components of it. One is uh, the road system, and, and fundamentally the extension of the road to Parkside Village. That connection is a really important connection for the county, for the community, and for downtown to be successful. Um, businesses downtown need ways for people to get to them and away from them, and so this project will include that connection, and it will also include the public plaza, uh, which is considered to be a key piece of infrastructure that was in the Crozet Master Plan. Um, the final design of that plaza will come really as soon as we get VDOT approval for the road system that, that uh, I think the community wants to build. And uh, this plaza piece is, uh, again, a, a piece that will, has involved a lot of public participation. We'll, we'll continue to need that uh, level of input as we go from what's really a schematic design to a finished design to make sure that the features and the programming of the plaza and the finishing of the plaza is consistent with what you want Crozet to be. 
there's been some conversation, I think there's an update tonight, just about this, uh, this whole issue of what is Crozet, where have we been, where are we, where do we want to go. That helps inform our design process as this moves forward. It also helps inform our design process with all the buildings that go up in downtown. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, the rest of the network, the phase two and three, you know, kind of phase out like this, and I'll roll through these quickly. I, I think one of the fundamental things that came out of the extensive sort of public uh, engagement process was a, cons a consensus around the fact that people wanted a gridded network of streets in their downtown so that people can get from one place to another uh, and have multiple ways to get there. And they wanted it to be pedestrian friendly, uh, bike friendly, um, and they didn't want uh, parking lots consuming most of the downtown area. So um, what's, what's in sort of contemplated at this point uh, after phase one would be phase two that includes a secondary road, uh, these, these blocks in downtown, and then ultimately uh, to make connections to the surrounding neighborhoods so that that gridded network uh, functions and provides uh, alternate ways for people to get around. So there are uh, several components to any public-private partnership. Um, these are all the ones that you know we've kind of been wrestling with over the last uh, year, year and a half. Uh, the pre-development obligations, um, primarily uh, around the design and control of the design, and then there's the road, the plaza, financing, and, and, and ultimately construction. Um, and this is kind of how, in phase one, those responsibilities broke down. So uh, we, have a, we have a goal to get phase one rezoned. That's likely to go to the board later this summer, probably in August. Um, we have created a set of architectural guidelines, which is being reviewed by the county, will also be reviewed by the CCAC, and probably, uh, most certainly, the DCI. That, that Architectural guideline will be in addition to the county's own architectural guidelines, which uh, sort of apply to everywhere in the county. Uh, and the idea was to come up with a code that really spoke to downtown Crozet because it's a unique place. And so it really deserves kind of an overlay district of its own. Uh, I'll show you that later. Um, the, uh, we're, uh, part of our charge is to create the plaza site plan uh, mm -hmm. that Concept plan is already done. Once the VDOT approval is secured, hopefully uh, with the kind of roads that uh, I think you guys want, uh, we'll launch into the final phase of design for the plaza. Um, and we've also got uh, some environmental issues that we're wrestling with on the site. Um, so uh, we did get, or we're able to secure an environmental planning grant that the county's helping us with, um, and the road plans you see on the on the. On the county side, uh, obviously they'll have to review our rezoning. Uh, they've already reviewed the road plans. Um, I'm happy to say uh, the county is, is completely supportive of the road network we want to build. They're completely supportive of the scale of the roads that we want to build. Uh, we got a challenge with EDOT still to, to make that happen, um, but it's, at least we're all on the same page, which is great. Uh, the county's agreed to do a market study. Uh, it's part of their comprehensive plan, the, the Crozet Master Plan. Um, that market study will better inform kind of how big downtown, the commercial component of downtown can ultimately be, how many commercial square feet is it, and, and how might that affect uh, the way phase two and phase three of this project get developed. Uh, parking is obviously a huge issue now, and it's going to become a much bigger issue um, as downtown gets built out. And so the county has agreed, and we've agreed to, to work on a parking study, uh, which would look at what our parking needs are uh, during, as we phase this project out. We're fortunate that in the first phase, we'll probably have a bunch of space to the east of phase one where we can put parking. Um, but as development progresses eastward, uh, parking will become a bigger and bigger issue. And so we're looking at some structured parking options. The, the shuttle is a possible solution. Shared parking downtown. Um, 
So the good news is I think the, the county recognizes that it's going to be a problem, and I think uh, they're going to try to get out in front of it, and we're going to try to get out in front of it as well. Um, Crozet Master Plan, as you know, is being updated. Uh, that process will start this fall. And then uh, the county will help uh, coordinate the remaining public engagement around both the road and the plaza. Uh, as that, those designs move forward, um, we now kind of have a team of county folks and uh, our development team that will work on that together. So in a nutshell, this is kind of what the agreement will look like, uh, or the agreement looks like in its current draft form as the board were to approve it. Um, we will make a $2 million contribution to the construction of the roads. Um, VDOT has approved a revenue share match uh, of about $2.3 million, and then we have about $500,000 worth of right-of-way that we will donate to the, uh, to the construction of those roads, uh, that budget. The plaza, which is projected to cost $3.2 million, will be financed through two vehicles. One, the county will contribute $1.6 million out of their capital reserves. Uh, and then we're going to borrow another $1.6 million, uh, which will be secured by us. And then as the project develops out and these commercial uses get up and running, obviously they generate tax revenue, um, real estate tax revenue as downtown gets built up. Um, and the county will take a portion of that tax revenue and uh, help us repay that $1.6 million um, plaza loan. So that's called a SIN TIF. It's a, actually a synthetic TIF. Um, and I think it's synthetic because typically when counties do TIFs, they, they do, they'll finance it using bonds, not a private developer uh, loan. So um, that's kind of it in a nutshell. That's what the board will review next week. Um, it's, uh, it's been an interesting journey, but we're super excited. And I hope you guys are excited, and I hope if, if you're supportive of the project, you'll come down and uh, let the board know that, that you're supportive. Um, before we get to questions, I just want to share with you some other things we're doing. Well, maybe I'll take some quick questions on the on that piece of it, and then I want to launch in and show you uh, a couple other uh, aspects of what we're working on. Yeah? I think we're all really interested in the roads that you have planned. Um, would there be a map available any place, or could you go back to your slide and just tell us what's coming in new and from where? Sure. Yeah. Uh, let me scroll back. So, just to get you oriented, um, we're right here. That's kind of the end of Library Avenue. So, Library Avenue will extend up to High Street. Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you. Bottom, bottom, sunshine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Library Avenue will extend up to High Street. High Street will extend over to this extension of the square. And then that road will extend all the way to Parkside Village. Um, this, uh, the, the county has a separate project, which is also a VDOT revenue share project, uh, to upgrade the existing square. Um, and that will happen, uh, that may end up happening actually before our project, which would be ideal. But they're going to upgrade the square and they're going to uh, build out Oak Street. Um, so we've had a lot of dialogues with the county just about the phasing and how do we maintain as much of the parking as possible during that process and where will people park if you're trying to get to these businesses during construction you know can, can they park on Oak Street uh, will there be other areas that we can open up um, but that's essentially the road network in phase one does that does that new road um, run parallel to the railroad tracks and yeah. intersect with High Street what does it, it intersect with it intersects with the square. Yeah, it intersects with High Street right here. That's High Street right there. Okay. Okay. So yeah. we don't, it'll intersect with High Street uh -huh. and the extension of the square. So where, I guess I don't know where that new road's going. Where, where, what's there now? 
Nothing. Parsa Village is on the east. It's mm -hmm. green. That's existing. And yeah, so this, this road stub exists. In, in, if, you, if you go down hilltop, right, you take a right right here, uh -huh. uh, and there's a stub out for extension of that road. The property is yours. I mean, it's part of the yeah, so all this. Part of the barns, it's, that's right. It's part of the yeah. yeah. Frank, does B dot want bigger or yes. smaller asphalt? B dot wants bigger. Not surprising. So yeah, one of is the circles the major. <laughs> uh, the circles were V dot's idea as well. Um, we did get them reduced in size, so they're they're what's classified as a mini roundabout, um, which actually doesn't take up that much more space than a regular roundabout, uh, or sorry, than a regular intersection, three-way intersection. Um, the road issue is challenging because what VDOT really wants, it's dead, this road's been designated as an urban collector road. And so with that comes a higher speed limit, comes a wider pavement section, comes a, the biggest problem, quite frankly, is the site distance that they require wipes out about 75% of the parking on this road. So. It's um, we're working hard, and again, I think that you know the fact that the county's totally supportive will help us. Um, but it's we're we're trying to get that. Uh, it, it's got to be a pedestrian-friendly section in downtown. It's got to be. And yes, um, two two quick things: ballpark timeline on phase one, and then two. Is there anything that this board could do tangibly to help you out? Resolutions are there sticking points in the county that we I'll get to that second. Okay. 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 So time frame, um, our our best guess right now, and it's really dependent on how quickly VDOT acts. Um, next spring we could start construction, uh, probably April May time frame. Um, that assumes that VDOT will approve uh, this design, and the, the road, the thirty percent plans have already been submitted. So, but because they've designated an urban collector instead of an urban street, we now need to apply for like four or five waivers from VDOT for all the things that aren't going to meet that standard. We want, a, we want a slower speed limit, we want a narrow pavement section, we want less site distance so we can put more on street parking. This is going to be an urban shopping district. It's not a, this is not a freeway. It's not a, uh, so, yeah, yeah. Which uh, phase two and three? You have Corona in the back now. Do yes. you see them uh, either a getting enlarged enlargement, or do you see this morphing into more companies like Corona coming in rather than mixed commercial or residential? In there? Yeah, I think Corona would obviously like to stay in downtown if they can. Um, the challenge is obviously the test track, and so um, we're looking at alternatives for them for a test track location. Uh, because they really need more space than they have now for the test room. But do you see more, more companies like Corona taking up spots in there as well? Yeah, we'd love to have more companies like Corona. I mean, I, I think that's the, the, the challenge is how do we create an environment in which companies want to locate in Crozet? There are a bunch of companies that, you know, are, are moving around in downtown Charlottesville, and uh, we've got a couple new companies that we hope, had hoped to attract to Crozet because they're, either their founders live out here or, or, or their CEOs live out here. And we're just, you know, we miss those opportunities because we're late to the game. And it's hard, you know, until people can understand and f like see this tangibly and understand what it is, they, it's hard for them to see the value. So our next challenge is really to be able to render, the, in particular, the plaza and the areas around the plaza in a way that, that helps people understand what it is we're creating. Because I think once they see it, uh, it's going to be pretty attractive. Um, but they got to see it, and it's you know, and the timing, of course, has been uncertain because of the VDOT issues. And gee, you know, is the county going to do it, or they're not going to do it, and so. Uh, once we have a firm timeline, I think it'll be a lot easier to 
start um, attracting them. Frank, yes. if I can help you out here. Yeah, I, yeah. Uh, I know we've got a lot of people in the room, and I think there might be some other issues okay. that want to be discussed. Yep. So I'd like to kind of jump in at this point and, and, uh, and say that uh, as part of the Downtown Jose Initiative, and we have Meg Holden here, who's currently the president of it, Mary Beth Bowen, who's uh, been helping us a lot. I'm on that board. Uh, I don't have a, 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 a display for you. I have a, a real life example. You can walk outside and look at the rubble and weeds. That'll be our plaza. And so that's what we are function, focused on, is that area of the plaza. It's, it's in kind of a, a, an artificial design right now, and, and we're, we're trying very hard <coughs> to think through what the needs are for the plaza. We do want it to be reflective, obviously, of what the community wants. We feel like what we are is just a, a conduit of the community feelings. And we've tried several times, we've held a lot of meetings. Most recently, uh, Mary Beth has hosted a couple of meetings uh, trying to think about what Crozet wants, right? And so I wonder if we, I know we, we want to try to keep this brief, if we can move directly to her. Sure. Uh, and I don't have anything else, but I don't, I'm, I'm welcome to talk to anybody uh, about the activities of the DCI. Uh, the key thing is, though, that next Wednesday, we have a Board of Supervisors meeting at 1 o'clock in downtown at the, at the county offices where we can come and speak to the value and importance of the plaza as well as the entire development so that BDOT will hear our voices too. Uh, so that was the key message I wanted to bring tonight was that there is an opportunity for us to do something and that's to go to the board meeting next Wednesday, one o'clock, and uh, give Ann all of our support and, 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 the, and the project our support. So with that, I, I might just ask Mary Beth to, to weigh in about what she has learned yeah, well, do you want me, I mean, I was just going to share what we learned. You know, yeah, I think that's great. I, the only thing left that I wanted to show folks is, is are the prototypes that we've already developed. So these are building prototypes uh, for downtown and, and the draft architectural code. Um, so, but if you want to go, you know, you can jump in and, um, I, I, yeah, I, I mean, I would scroll through this extremely quickly. So, um, this is a draft. This is what's being reviewed by the county right now. Um, it's, you know, a lot of it is how do we create a box that people can operate in that's not so small. Crozet is eclectic to begin with. We want to kind of foster that. And so this, this kind of attempts to establish that. Obviously some of these uh, images will change over time, but it's a lot of conversation about form, what's good form, what's bad form, et cetera, et cetera. Um, spaces in between, um, a lot about DC, the existing DCD code and how that gets expanded. Um, so, uh, Frank, would you yeah. be able to provide the uh, CCAC with that sure. yep. document sure. And, sure. and your other presentation? Because yep. yep. I think people would kind of like to see that. Do you want to put it on the CCA website? Frank? Not at all. Yeah. Now, it's again, it's in draft form. So, yeah. I think, yeah. We'll, we'll, yeah. yeah. We'll, 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 yeah. And all the materials for the hearing are, I mean, the board meeting are number 11 on the agenda, which is already posted, so you can go there and get all great. the great details about that. Great. I'll share that. Thanks. Thanks, Frank. The you know downtown Crozet initiative is, is really focused right now. We've been working with um, Frank for four years on this project, um, and really the main mission is to make sure that this development of downtown represents Crozet. And so we've you know had many meetings over the course of these four years, and we're kind of revisiting this again. Um, things have changed since our last community meetings, but. We recently held two meetings um, in May, and we had about 40 people in attendance, and we just had a brainstorm session about what do we think Crozet is now, and ideally, what do we want it to be? And so I just wanted to review a couple of concepts that came out of those two meetings. Um, the first is that I think everyone is on the same page in terms of wanting a vibrant downtown. Um, and wanting a place, you know, where families can go hang out, people can sit outside, a real sense of community. Um, when, so 
Then there were other themes when we talked about what is Crozet and, and what do we want to help preserve in downtown. And one of those is that Crozet is a very active community in two ways. It's socially active in terms of volunteerism, in terms of people being politically active, but it's also physically active um, with the runners and the bikers <coughs> and people being outside and you know drinking wine at the wineries, uh, walking around downtown and we want to preserve that feeling for, for downtown. Um, another theme is, you know, we call it Mayberry. And it's a theme where everybody knows your name. Um, one of the exercises we did was, if Crozet had a theme song, what would it be? And Cheers was one of the oh, yeah. like, Yes, that's it. <laughs> so um, that, that's another theme. People really want to preserve that feeling of walking into the pharmacy and they have your prescription ready you know, without you even telling them to your name. And uh, so we don't want to lose that sense of uh, made areas. <laughs> um, another thing that came out of this is Crozet is very connected um, in terms of physical connection, where it's on 64, it's between Waynesboro and Charlottesville, it's a short drive to Richmond and DC, but also connected in terms of our trails, um, the bike routes that are close by, the Appalachian Trail, the railroad is a connection point. Um, and uh, apparently there's a dark fiber that's that's going through Crozet that hasn't been tapped into, but in terms of like a high speed potential connection, um, someone brought that up. And people wanna people wanna keep this, they want it to get they want it to still be easy to get from point A to B. Um, and so this this connected theme, you know, was found throughout our, our meetings. And these are in no particular order, because the next one was a huge one, and that's the beauty of Crozet and the mountain vistas and um, the rolling hills and the orchards and the you know beautiful vineyards um, and preserving that beauty as, as Crozet continues to evolve. Um, another theme is that Crozet is very involved in the arts community, and if that could somehow be woven throughout downtown. That would be awesome, whether it's through music or you know, the local artisans here, murals, of course. And then, um, well, this was another big one. When you think of Crozet currently, what do you think of? And wineries and breweries, you know, kept coming up over and over. There was a big drinking theme. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, and it's true, there are a lot here, there are high quality wineries and breweries um, in such a small town. So those are kind of the main things that we learned, um, that we heard from people, and um, like I said, there were about 40 people in attendance total between these two meetings, and so now what we want to do is continue to reach out, um, we're going to be asking some questions online, on the Facebook page. Uh, on the website, you know, we've had a few recommendations to maybe uh, go out and pull people, like the upcoming fireworks display, um, just to just to get more input for this process. And then, what are you going to do with your input? Um, well, we we had originally thought we were going to um, create, you know, use this information to create a brand for Crozet, um, maybe a logo and a tagline. Since then, the DCI has kind of reconvened, and and we're thinking, you know, maybe we need to keep the focus on downtown Crozet. And so, at this point, we're just collecting information. If something comes out of it, great. But okay. yeah. I think it would be helpful if you summarize some of the physical activity stuff to support what Frank was talking about with VDOT in terms of making it really pedestrian friendly, slower speed limits, so we can support all the bikers and the walkers and the families and all the stuff that you just said, just strikes me as a really important testimony next Wednesday. I agree, um, and that's what we intend to say. Cool. Good. All right, does anybody have any more questions for Mary Beth or Doug? Um, or can we let Mary Beth and
I'm now an item, apparently. Uh, am I good to stand up in that corner just so I can see? Yeah, it? if you would stand up here, that would oh, be Oh gosh, stand up. All right. I don't get a single bouncing music note yeah, behind kind of it. <laughs> um, so hi, I'm Danny Weissong. I know a lot of you. Uh, I'm going to wait for this to stop because Sorry, I know, I you know, know. you're fine. Um, so first off, I live on St. George Avenue. Like, show of hands, who knows where St. George Avenue is? Yay! All right, and I'm here with a lot of my neighbors from St. George Avenue. If you guys want to stand up really quick. Hey, yay, us. All right. So, um, yeah, it's a big street. If you guys know where it is, we're one of the oldest streets in Crozet. It's a lot of the oldest homes in Crozet are there. My house turns 100 this year. Um, we've got older houses on the street. Kale beats me by a good 20 years. Um, and so as residents of St. George Avenue and, and the surrounding area, it, it recently came to our attention, chatting with some of our neighbors in the community and hearing with other folks, um, that Anderson Funeral Home and several of the adjoining lots have been proposed to the Diocese of Richmond as a potential site for a future church, a Catholic church in town. And while we welcome the addition of a Catholic church to our community, um, St. George is located within the Crozet Historic District and we're zoned as residential. Um, and the proposal, as we understand it, threatens a lot of historical properties that are listed on the National Register of Historic Places and the Virginia Department of Historic Resources. Um, and the potential location would also increase traffic on our residential street and would increase pedestrian risk on a section of road that has no sidewalks. If you guys have been on St. George, you know the sidewalk stops at Crozet Baptist and it's just road. Um, St. George is fairly narrow. You know, we kind of got to pull to the side if we're going to drive past each other on the road. I mean, it's nice to see our neighbors, but it's, it's still pretty narrow. Uh, and additionally, we already see a fair bit of traffic due to Crozet Baptist Church, and we have two after-school programs uh, that are currently run on, on St. George Avenue. And additionally, the, the proposed site has a really high water table and existing stormwater issues. I think all of us in my neighborhood here could share when it rains, we, we deal with it for the next couple of weeks. Um, we get a lot of floods. <laughs> we have a pretty high water table. Um, and this would, you know, with this proposal, it would, it would further be impacted by creating, uh, you know, an additional large paved parking lot would lead to additional stormwater and additional flooding on our properties. From what we understand of the proposal, it also involves a cut through uh, in between Railroad Avenue and St. George Avenue going down that hill straight to the lot of Anderson Funeral Home, a paved ramp in effect on a pretty, pretty steep hill. But I want to step outside the immediate challenges that the proposal faces, and I want to think long term. We all know Crozet is growing. Like the projected annual growth of Crozet and Western Albemarle, the subsequent increase in the church's congregation, needs to be, this church needs to be sizable with room to grow. They want to grow. We want to see this church do well. But redeveloping and infilling an existing historic residential neighborhood doesn't provide that room. And it's contrary to the master plan. That's our charter here. The master plan's intent is to, quote, preserve historical and residential neighborhoods while concentrating mixed-use development to revitalize Crozet's downtown community. We've just been talking about that today. And that intent just stands in stark contrast to this proposal. And I, I want to say, like, personally, I grew up Catholic, my family's Catholic. I understand that it's been a long, frustrating search for the Catholic community here. I spoke with members of the Catholic community here. I spoke with Mike Marshall at length, who very graciously gave me his time regarding their proposal. And I sincerely thank them for taking the time to explain their desire to find a location that lets their community take root in Crozet and blossom. We all want to see that. And I know we all look forward to them finding a home and finding their permanent place in our town. But we owe it to our same town to make sure it's a location that has the support of their future neighbors and their potential future parishioners. The St. George Avenue location simply doesn't provide that room for them to blossom. Crozet is a designated growth area, 2.4% Western Albemarle County for the upcoming years. And that site would quickly be outgrown by a growing parish only after compromising the historic nature of our street. As a street, and as my community with my, with my neighbors here, we're united in our opposition to this proposal and we firmly believe that the church should look elsewhere, perhaps as an anchor for downtown revitalization or elsewhere, rather than as new development which threatens one of Crozet's most historic neighborhoods. As we all know, taking a look at all of these meetings, what we've seen in our paper, what we've seen on the news, we're constantly under pressure from development. That's what this is all about. So let's encourage the church to help build the community in Crozet we all love by picking a different location rather than just being another development which negatively impacts our historical neighborhood. We've circulated a petition in the past six or seven days. We've got about 50 signatures. People on our street are fired up and we're just gonna continue being opposed to this. I wanna see a Catholic church grow here. I wanna see that personally grow with our community, but it needs to be the right place, not the place they're simply looking at right now. You That's put all your I got. Petition yeah. Yeah. yeah, and we have a digital copy. We have a paper copy. I wasn't going to start handing them out to people, but I can get those out to people. 
so we can figure out a way to distribute that. But I thank you for your time. I know it's been a long meeting. We learned a lot about hydrochloridine, so I appreciate everybody's time. Thank you. Yes, sir. What does the diocese say about this? I mean, where is Richmond? Is that the where, where this is coming out? What does the Richmond diocese have to say about yeah. it? From my understanding of the process, there's something called the Building and Restoration Committee. That's currently a diocese group that takes a look at a proposal that's submitted to it. Well, are they engaged in the community at all? I mean, have they? I have not been. Not. You been no. 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 We heard who about. Are they, who are they talking? From what I understand, it's the Church Search Committee. I don't know what the proper name of it is. It's been in contact with the diocese of Richmond. Can you make sure to expand this beyond just the St. George like residents so all members of Brazil like, know what's going on and can have Sure, we started locally, of course, yeah. because you know our kids are in the street right 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 now. That's well, kind of I just um, want to say your you know support for what you're saying sure. is not just in terms of the uh, the diocese process. Um, like I reached out to the diocese, I spoke with some people there, I got a better sense of it. But I understand it's a fairly it's a process where a site is proposed. And then when the diocese gives approval on it, then from what I've gathered, the, the process that moves forward would be the typical applying for a special use permit, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so you're reaching out to the really diocese may have stimulated them to be a little more proactive in reaching out to the community? Is that what no, I heard about this from the community second and third hand from people who said, hey, I heard Anderson Funeral Home is going to turn into our new church. And I went, that's across the street from me. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. And then I had, uh, I followed up with Mike, who gratefully, you know, gracefully filled me in on this. And then, yeah, so I think it's sitting with the diocese as of right now. I think it was submitted a couple of months ago. This is just news to all of us, which is why we're here today. I think one of the things you might want to consider doing is helping them find another option. Because they've been looking for years. Understood. I understand it's a long slog. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's hurdles there. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, there's the Downtown Birthday Initiative. Uh, there's other areas if you look around. I'm aware that things cost money. <laughs> I'm aware that this, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm aware that the reason it's probably a potential site is because the cost is somewhat lower yeah. than additional areas. But you also need to weigh that against the Prose Master Plan. Exactly. Sure. I'm not saying. I'm just saying. No, I understand that it's easy to complain about a problem. What you can also do is propose a solution. But is that our job as residents? I mean, I think. Yeah. It, yes. I think like it's good neighborly. I would say it's good neighborly too. It's also, well, I would say it's Senate community's job, right? It's not just ours. Well, I think the whole of the community has been trying, and um, you know, when you come to a meeting, like not in my street, find another street, yeah, and sure. you come across. Well, what about the street? Well, Frank was just saying they're looking for the downtown for the initiative, public private partnerships. Whoa. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh no, that's, I was saying I was saying louder what they were saying. We're kind of shaking. Oh, they want to do the whole thing. <laughs> I think it might be helpful. Um, I'm a neighbor. My name is Michaela Hardy. I'm a neighborhood planner with Admiral County, and I just want to clarify that the county has not received an application for this project. Right. We've not had any pre-application. You were never saying that, but I just do want right. to clarify. And if there were a special use permit to come. Um, they would notify the impact that there be a period of time. Well, this would be the forum for yeah. our community meeting. So Andrew Newell is a neighborhood planner that's normally here, and we can continue to communicate with you all. I'm happy sure. to share contact. Yeah, we emailed him today as well. Yes. So. Thanks, is, everyone. Is Anderson going out of business, or? No. You would have to ask, but well, I, I don't. Mean, is it for sale? Is that what you're saying, or? We don't know. Oh, you don't know. I'm saying that, uh, that I was told that's the site that was proposed to the diocese, but I'm not going to speculate on how his business is doing. That's not my that's not that's not my guess to me. His life expectancy skyrocketing. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, all right. We managed to finish on time, and uh, I think that's it. Tim, did you want to make any plug for? Your Yes, I'd like to plug for the Crozier Independence Day celebration on June 29th. Um, please make sure you come. We'll have the sign-up changes page um, up this weekend. We need volunteers to help, particularly with a one-hour shift at the admission gate where people come in and make their
I would love for everybody on the CCAC to sign up for something on that day. Right. And I would love for the CCAC to have a table. The first pavilion, the Dasa pavilion, is going to have space for nonprofits. And we'd love to have you guys have a table there that shows some of the master plan revision process and just you know, inform people about your existence. Um, same for the DCI. I mean, the DCI has a great opportunity for you guys to get. You know, we get somewhere between two to 4,000 people yeah, in that right. little bit of time. So it's a great time to, to find out about Crochet Revenues. And I think to Ali's point about asking CCAC or spreading the word out to other community members about signing up for these time slots, I mean, I guess it's a matter of perspective, but I think it's fun okay. to do that. I love doing dates, fun, and see. You get a real, like, know. community. Yeah, and a what what's happened in the past <laughs> is if there's lots of slots left open, then a few people end up working really long shifts. And yeah. a lot of us keep. I got a little back. grumpy at the gate. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of us <laughs> got a lot of like a little come back. I was ready to go back. It. It. But I have watched community members who've signed up and their time slots over, no one's ever replaced. And they keep on, but then yeah. I don't see them the next year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, those people present it was a negative experience, where it is really a positive experience. And I really would encourage. Yeah, everyone. if everybody did half an hour, then no one would have to yeah. do like two hours. Like it really <laughs> is that bad. It actually is kind of fun, and there's a lot of the atmosphere that's happening. And watching so many people come through. And, and nobody and has to do it while well. during the fireworks. That's everyone right. just watches. Yeah. <laughs> Tim, how do you want checks to the fireworks made out in case anybody wants to give you one? Crozet Board of Trade. Okay. Thank you. And if, if you go to the crozetcommunity.org website, there's a site there for contributing online. You can find them do it online. And that also will be where we put the sign up genius link and provide also details about the event itself. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Oh, that's okay. I, I understand wanting to hang out. I don't care what you're doing.